I mentioned last week that one of the challenges of pastoring is there are certain situations um, and circumstances where I feel very confident in how to pastor. And other times, I lean on um, a variety of, of sources that are good for my mind and heart. Um, oftentimes when your stories weigh on me heavily because of the kind of human I am, I'll read Eugene Peterson, who wrote a number of books about pastoral ministry. A lot of times when I think the culture is too challenging for me to think through mentally, I turn to a pastor in New York City named Tim Keller. And oftentimes when I'm discouraged, frankly, um, by politics, not just in the United States, but around the globe, I will turn to the writing um, essays and books of Michael Ware. It was turned on to him about 10 years ago by a number of pastors. So I asked him last June, June of 2021, if he would come and preach. Not about those things so much as about being a Christian amidst the chaos around us. If you have your Bible, we're looking at 1 Corinthians over the next few months, and specifically this morning, chapter 10, verses 23 through 33. If you've read the book of Corinthians, you know that they were very ununified. They struggled mightily. And this is uh, Paul drawing in one of the many threads towards the end of the book. I'm going to pray before I read the scripture. Lord, would you open our ears and our minds and our hearts to your word read and preached, that we might be encouraged by the power of the gospel yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. 1 Corinthians 10, verse 23, all things are lawful, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful, but not all things build up. Let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. Eat whatever is sold in the meat market without raising any question on the ground of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. If one of the unbelievers invites you to dinner and you're disposed to go, eat whatever is set before you without raising any question on the ground of conscience. But if someone says to you, this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it for the sake of the one who informed you and for the sake of conscience. I don't mean your conscience, but his. For why should my liberty be determined by someone else's conscience? If I partake with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of that for which I give thanks? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God, just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many, that they may be saved. This is the word of the Lord. Praise be to Christ. Well, it is uh, a great, great joy to be with you all today. Had a wonderful time at the earlier service and looking forward to the Q&A a little bit later on. Um, yeah, let's make sure of this. Okay. Um, I want to thank Matt and uh, really thank all of you for, for hosting me. Um, I got to stay in the retreat center uh, last night. What a, like a gift that is. What a wonderful thing to have on, on the property here. And I hope that that space blesses many uh, over the years. Uh, as Matt mentioned, I was invited here to talk about religion and politics, the two topics you're not supposed to discuss around the dinner table and not m many other places. <laughs> uh, uh, have you ever stopped to ask yourself why that is? It wasn't until recently I came to think that the saying is generally true, but for opposing reasons. People don't want to talk about politics because they hold their views too tightly. Too much of their identity is staked in politics. People don't want to talk about religion because they are haunted by the idea that they do not stake their lives in the spiritual things enough, that God takes up too little space in their life. How is it that this developed? Dallas Willard, a Christian author and philosopher, describes what he called the disappearance of moral knowledge. 
Willard writes, what characterizes life in so-called Western societies today, however, is the absence or presumed absence of knowledge of good and evil, right and wrong, virtue and vice, knowledge that might serve as a rational basis for moral decisions, for policy enactments, and for a rational critique of established patterns of response to moral issues. Deeply tied to, and a part of this disappearance, is the relocation of religion from the domain of knowledge to that of faith. Again, the relocation of religion from the domain of knowledge to that of faith, and with it, the weakened perception of the public utility of religion. Now, this applies to and has affected our public life, our political life. The matter of whether Christians have anything to offer our politics is contested by both Christians and non-Christians. As religious disaffiliation has increased in this country, a greater number of Americans believe Christianity doesn't have much to offer. In fact, Christianity and religion generally is increasingly viewed as part of the problem in America as opposed to part of the solution. It's interesting to note, though, that even with these declines, there are plenty of non-Christians who will speak of the utility of Christian resources to the common good, Christian ideas of charity, mercy, forgiveness, for instance. Uh, you will find, if you listen closely enough, concerns that even among those who don't share our faith are, are worried that we might be missing something, we might lose something uh, if, if Christianity uh, uh, is, is sort of lost in our public life. Still, that notwithstanding, it makes some sense that those who do not share our faith will have doubts about how valuable or necessary Christian knowledge is to the public. What we're more hesitant to recognize is that there are significant numbers of Christians who do not think much of what Christianity has to offer the public. Some Christians, wrongly but not without merit or cause, look at all of the ways Christianity has been misused in our politics and conclude that the most reliably safe way to proceed is to try and enact a secular politics somehow. To say, well, my faith is for my private life. When I go, when I'm voting, when I'm talking about politics, I'm, I'm somehow putting on a secular self. It, my values stripped of religious motivation or or input. Other Christians have a predominantly private conception of the faith and cannot readily identify what, if any, implications their faith might have for politics. And so we end up with a kind of sloganeering of scripture or religious phrases during election season or in response to the political news of the day citations of, of Second Chronicles that serve as the foundation for worship events that pose as political rallies that pose as worship events. Well, news of political malfeasance might earn a side response of they need Jesus, and they do. The words say less than the eased detachment which underlies them. These kinds of statements are a way of distancing oneself from the work of politics, not actually engaging in it. So whether it's a Christian perspective that withdrawal and disengagement is the best we can do or a Christian sloganeering that is more about an expressive affiliation than it is about content or character, a crisis of confidence lies under it all. In his essay, Membership, C.S. Lewis writes, a sick society must think much about politics as a sick man must think much about his digestion. However, if either comes to regard it as the natural food of the mind, if either forgets that we think of such things only in order to be able to think of something else, then what was undertaken for the sake of health has become itself a new and deadly disease. Our culture and many people uh, in our country and in our churches are sick with that new and deadly disease. Politics is causing great spiritual harm in America. It's doing so in part because in the great vacuum that was left behind by the disappearance of moral knowledge, a totally political, a totally partisan logic is filling the void. 
In October 2020, a group of over a dozen scholars from a range of fields uh, that study polarization issued a dire warning. They said, a poisonous cocktail of othering, aversion, and moralization poses a threat to democracy. And in a brief essay, these scholars laid out their concerns and put forward a framework to describe the particular kind of polarization we have today. They wrote, for decades, scholars have studied polarization as an ideological matter. How strongly Democrats and Republicans diverge vis-a-vis -vis po political goals and policy, uh, policy goals. Such competition among groups in the marketplace of ideas is a hallmark of a healthy democracy. But more recently, researchers have identified a second type of polarization, one focusing less on triumphs of ideas than on dominating the abhorrent supporters of the opposing party. The scholars offered an interdisciplinary integration of the various insights uh, from their research uh, to develop what they called political sectarianism. That's how they describe the nature of polarization in our politics today, political sectarianism. And political sectarianism is the tendency to adopt a moralized identification with one political group and against the other. Listen to what they describe. They write, quote, Democrats and Republicans have grown more contemptuous of opposing partisans for decades and at similar rates. Only recently, however, has this aversion exceeded their affection for co-partisans. Out-party hate, listen, out-party hate has become more powerful than in-party love as a predictor of voting behavior. They continue, this aversion to opposing partisans might make strategic sense if partisan identity served as a strong proxy for political ideas. But given that sectarianism is not driven primarily by such ideas, holding opposing partisans in contempt on the basis of their identity alone precludes innovative cross-party solutions and mutually beneficial compromises. In other words, Political hatred has become so profound that it outstrips people's desire to actually help themselves, much less than, say, pursue the common good. The consequences of this political sectarianism are serious. They include links to governance, uh, such as a compromising of political representation, the incentivization of anti-democratic tactics, the undermining of government competency. This political antipathy reaches into our interpersonal and social lives as political sectarianism has, quote, increased the social distance between Democrats and Republicans. And so political sectarianism is one of the defining features of American political life and therefore American life today. It's made up of three core ingredients, othering, which is the tendency to view opposing partisans as essentially different or alien to oneself. Aversion, which is the tendency to dislike and distrust opposing partisans. And moralization, the tendency to view opposing partisans as iniquitous. Political sectarianism demands a constant state of conflict, and with it, politics becomes a form for antagonism rather than public service. It's one thing for politicians to approach our politics in this way, to never stop campaigning. It's another for citizens to view politics as a stage for animosities and resentments. And this is the critical development. We're all either political strategists or political cynics now. Not only does a critical percentage of citizens not check the logic of self and party interests of politicians, not only do they stand aside indifferently, no, now we, citizens, step inside of the logic of the perpetual campaign strategists. We try it on for ourselves. And too often we demand our politicians follow it. And so if the logic of aversion, othering, and a misplaced moralism is not what should guide our politics as Christians, what should? We can draw on many places in Scripture and in the Christian tradition that would help us understand how our faith pushes us toward the public, but let's talk about Jeremiah's message to the exiles. 
These people, God's people, found themselves in a land that was not their own among a people who despised them. And yet Jeremiah's prophecy did not suggest that they lie low or that they take a posture of opposition toward the Babylonians. No, instead they are instructed to, quote, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. For Christians, one inescapable conclusion of this extraordinary command is that we are obliged to work for the benefit and flourishing of all people, whether or not they see the world as we do or agree with us in any way. Christians' obligation is not to their tribe, but to their God, a God who cares deeply for all people. And if a Christian's political ideas and actions are not intended toward the good of their enemies, their political witness is not Christian in its character. When it is, everybody benefits. When Jesus came centuries later, he ushered in a new era of good news for all people, not just as individuals, but for the world. Near the beginning of his ministry, Jesus shocked and angered those in the synagogue by reading from the prophet Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. The meaning of this is as clear as it is revolutionary. Jesus came to redeem not just souls, but all things. And the new life that he has welcomed us into is not to be lived in isolation from others. Jesus' commission to the public square can be found in Matthew 5, where he, says to his, where he says to his disciples, You are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Christians care about politics because we care about our neighbors and our communities. And political decisions impact our neighbors' well-being. As a citizen, you do not choose to have political influence. You already have it. Therefore, sitting out of politics does not absolve you of blame for the state of our politics. Your sitting out is your choice about how to steward the responsibility you've been given. Faithfulness is not confined to any one sphere of life. It may look different in different arenas, it certainly does, but faithfulness is for all of life, including the political. Politics is one of the essential forms in which we can love our neighbor. Now, this is a very different approach to our political life than what is offered by political sectarianism. A politics of aversion, othering, and moralism leaves no room for willing the good of our neighbors. As Christians, we do not bring what we have to offer as an imposition, but as an act of loving service. We need to tend to the orientation of our hearts in politics at least as much as we tend to the positions we hold and the candidates we support. In the introduction to his book, The Great Omission, Willard writes that, quote, there is a great deal of disappointment expressed today about the character and the effects of Christian people, about Christian institutions, and at least by implication about the Christian faith and understanding of reality. Most of the disappointment comes from Christians themselves who find that what they profess just isn't working, not for themselves, nor, as far as they could see, for those around them. Willard wrote elsewhere that, quote, we have been through a period when the dominant theology simply had nothing to do with discipleship. It had to do with proper belief, with God seeing to it that individuals did not go to the bad place but to the good place. But that happened in such a way that the predominant thought is that a person can have the worst character possible and still get into the good place if he believed the right thing. This disconnection became increasingly burdensome to the church itself until we came to the point that, as is widely discussed, there is not a clear difference between Christians and those who are not Christian. One reason for the division in this country and in the church, the reason for so much disunity, 
is that we have confused the gospel for a set of doctrinal positions. We think God is primarily concerned that we provide mental assent to a couple of statements about our faith when God is really concerned with the kind of people we are becoming. But if we believe the Christian life is about holding the right set of positions, that that is the sum and total of the Christian life, we're likely to bring that view uh, uh, into our view of politics. As you walk through 1 Corinthians together as a church, you'll find that this is very much the dynamic that Paul is seeking to address. When the Apostle Paul was writing to the Corinthians, he was addressing a community, as Matt said, that was in deep disunity. Paul had helped form this community through his teachings, but they were straying from their foundational commitments. Sin, false teachers, parochial motives and interests were creating, well, polarization. This is a polarized community that Paul is speaking into. Paul's letter to the Corinthians then represents an attempt to speak clarity into the conflict, to help the community reform around its foundations. And so as you read Paul's letter, you discover that this is a community obsessed with law but ignorant of the heart. They are divided in part because of the drive to make the penultimate ultimate, the drive to make matters of conscience, matters of inclusion or exclusion, inclusion or exclusion into the very promises of God. And yet Paul repeatedly pushes them to view their conduct not in terms of what is allowed, what is permissible, but what is edifying for the community, for the good of others. He gives similar advice in his letter to the Galatians, a similarly uh, polarized community. And there Paul instructs them to do something radical, something completely contrary to everything polarization promotes. I think as we think about uh, what the kind of guidance would be to even the polarized communities in this country, you think of power sharing agreements. Or, uh, you know, well, you guys could be in charge on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. The other half could be in charge the other days. Like, let's just develop a structure so that you don't end up killing each other. That's sort of our highest aspiration, right? A more uh, maybe silly example, I think it was the pilot episode of Full House. Uh, The daughters are... Uh, they share a room and they're fighting with each other. And so the dad, Bob Sag, I think he was Danny, right? Right, Bob Sag was Danny Tanner. I always mix him up. But uh, he decides to, he takes, I think, tape and puts it down the middle of the girl's room and says, look, neither of you cross the, cross the line. And, and that's it. Like, this is the best we could do. You, you sisters are not going to get along, but you can, we'll limit the harm you could do to one another. Just keep you on separate sides of the room. Paul's command is quite different than that. In the, speaking into the heart of a divided community, he doesn't call for power sharing. He doesn't split the difference. He tells them they ought to, quote, carry one another's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the love of Christ. It's a call that goes completely contrary to the logic of polarization. Where we might have the aspiration that the, the most we could do is not harm one another. Paul says, actually, take the other side's burdens as your own. Consider their concerns your own concern. The command shows no favoritism. The call is not to one group only, to those with power or without it, or even solely to the strong or the weak. In some contexts, it might be considered to be an offensive call. People who felt aggrieved, who felt embattled, Paul was asking them too to carry the burdens of others. Everyone together is part of a community as children of the same God. And therefore, they ought to carry one another's burdens. What would it look like if we brought hearts oriented toward carrying one another's burdens into our political life and decisions? What would it look like if we stopped treating the fruit of the Spirit as irrelevant to politics, as somehow not up to the task of our politics, and instead decided that we would not, we will not, cordon off God from that part of our lives. Love, joy, peace, forbearance, 
kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. These things are not just for our private life, whatever that is. They are not just for our marriages or our parenting or how we treat one another at church, though I've been very impressed with how you all treat one another at church and how I've been treated. But we can actually bring these things with us into all of life. I want to encourage you that Jesus is up to the task of the challenges that we read about in the newspaper. And that the world is a perfectly safe place in which we can be the kind of people Jesus has called us to be. Gentleness is viable in public life. The highest aspiration we have to have is not just that we could be kind to the people in church, that we could be kind to the people we pass, uh, 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 to our family members. But even in the midst of political disagreement, gentleness, kindness, forbearance are the way of Jesus. Dallas Willard uh, defines joy as a pervasive and constant sense of well-being. And over the last five or six years, I've asked, uh, I've asked uh, folks I've been talking to, how many of you would define our political life as full of a pervasive and constant sense of well-being? And it's a laugh line, right? We have to ask ourselves, wh wh why, why is that? And, and are we too accepting of that reality in our public life but in our own lives? How, how many of us know people who have the sweetest dispositions, who have been calming influences in our lives, in our families, in our communities. And yet we've, we've noticed, uh, and I'll, I'll speak personally, I have a, I have a family member, uh, uh, the, the gentlest person I know, really, um, sit them for three hours in front of cable news and for reasons they can't quite explain, they're snapping at loved ones. They're expressing things about people in the grocery store that are just inconsistent with the kind of person you know them to be. And yet somehow the logic of our politics has sort of short-circuited the kind of person they are and that Jesus is making them to be. And if that short-circuiting uh, doesn't get addressed, it's not just that we will approach politics in a, and that'll be sort of a check mark, uh, a sort of deficiency. What it will mean is we will not be integrated people. The kind of people we are has much to do with the kind of politics we have. And so let's be attentive to the kind of people we're becoming. Let us pray that the Holy Spirit would be our helper in such a way that we might have the resources we need to take off our old self with its practices and put on the new self, put on the character of Christ in all of life in a way that we might bless our communities, that we might bless our politics, that we might provide a glimpse of a different kind of logic than that of aversion, of othering, of a misplaced moralism. May God help us in that. Let me close with prayer. Father, thank you that you have not just offered us teachings that we must sort of go off and somehow learn how to, uh, on our own, how to be the kind of people you have called us to be. You have not offered us simply teachings, but you've offered us a life. Scripture, uh, in Scripture you say this amazing thing. You say, if you, if you love me, you will obey my teachings and my Father will love you, and we will come to you, and we will make our home with you. So, Lord, make your home with us. Help us to follow you in all of life. Your kingdom has all of the resources for us to do that. And so we ask that you, your will be done, that earth will look a little more like heaven 
because you are drawing us into the life of the heavens, the eternal life that you offer. And uh, what a blessed inheritance that is. What a blessed inheritance. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.